Uh, welcome to the Jordan Center for Persian Studies. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have our annual Elahe Mirjalali uh, Omidyar lecture series. Uh, this is, uh, these lectures uh, take place because of the generosity of the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute, uh, who has given us funding for three years. Uh, to have uh, symposiums uh, as well as uh, lectures on various aspects of the Iranian world. Uh, I am not going to introduce the speaker today, rather I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask uh, our uh, new professor, uh, the holder of the chair associated with the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute, uh, uh, Professor Matthew Kanipa, who is uh, the best of the best in the ancient Iranian world in terms of art and archaeology, uh, to do the proper introduction. Please, Professor Kanipa. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Matthew Kanipa, I hold the uh, Alahe Vidyar Mir Jalali Presidential Chair in Art History and Archaeology of Ancient Iran here. And uh, we're very grateful to the Roshan Institute for uh, funding uh, these symposiums and, and this lecture too. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Chiara Gasparini, uh, who will be speaking tonight. Uh, Chiara received her PhD in transcultural studies, um, and specifically in global art history, from Heidelberg University in Germany. And her research focuses on Central Asian textiles and wall painting. And I, I can say, you know, just straight uh, out, of the, out of the gate, that she is one of the world's experts in Central Asian textiles. And you know, she's really established herself at the core of this field. And she knows this material unlike anybody else, I mean, down to just the microfiber. <laughs> Um, so she's currently teaching Asian art history at San Jose State University and UC Riverside. And her book, uh, Transcending the Patterns, Silk Road Cultural and Artistic Interactions Through Central Asian Textiles, 7th through 14th Centuries, will be published uh, by the University of Hawaii Press in uh, fall 2019. And this is a publication that we're all very much looking forward to. And it will uh, be a very important book for the field, I think. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll have uh, Professor Gasparini come forward. She'll be speaking on reorienting Sitinian textiles from wool to silk beyond talking books now. Thank you very much to Raj and Matthew. Uh, it's a really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I had a great professor like Matthew Kanepa during my graduate studies. So. He was my external mentor, and still he is actually. We still consider him my mentor for all the Iranian world, coming from Chinese uh, studies. So, um, talking about textile is not exactly easy, but I try to make it easy because it's very, very technical. It's a very technical field. So, if you try to Google Sasanian textiles, this is what will appear. A series of textile fragments, generally with animals, often enclosed in rumbles or medallions. Although they are often not radiocarbon dated and the provenance is unknown, they are accepted as Sasanian. <coughs> Many museums and institutions have published online similar textiles, confirming them as a Sasanian. For instance, the caption of this specific fragment uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York that has been dated between the 5th and the 8th century says, and I quote, this remarkably well-preserved textile showing rams could have been produced in a Sassanian center in Iran or even Iraq. Sassanian imperial work of this quality were valued along the Silk Road and made their way as far as Eastern Central Asia and China. It is true, indeed, that these texts are well valued along the Silk Road, but most likely it was the other way around. From Central Asia, including the western region of China, they made their way to the west. 
Interestingly, uh, the so-called Sardinian taxons have been discovered in many Eurasian places, except then in Iran and in China, uh, where we can find only some pictorial evidence. We no doubt similar motifs appear widely on Sassinian circles and seals, as well as on Sassinian and Central Asian metalwork. So today I would like to reorient the so-called Sassinian textile and discuss the development and evolution of this specific weaving that most likely, as I said, were created around the fifth, between the fifth and the sixth century in the Central Asia. Um, area specifically between Sogdiana and uh, Xinjiang and Turfan. Um, they evolve, however, from a Turkey Iranian textile imagery that we can trace back to the Achaemenid period. And there are some external areas that really inherited these uh, textile imagery, like uh, Qinghai province, more or less there on the map um, in China. That is one of uh, those areas that in the last four or five years really caught my attention. And until recently, in fact, it is hidden beautiful text uh, that I will present later as a main unique case uh, study. When we look at text, uh, we cannot just look at the iconography. Uh, as I always say, and I like to remark, a textile is not a painting. It can function like one, but it's not a two-dimensional ground, and I use ground because it's the proper textile word for a textile surface. A textile is rather a three-dimensional ground that requires engineering technical skills. It is important to note that besides the iconographic analysis, in fact, we can distinguish these Sassanian textiles looking at their technical features, which differentiate them from the Chinese and the Byzantine types. And I will discuss some of these features later. Also, the material use is not just a detail. In fact, the majority of the Sassanian texts from the West, especially those discovered in Egypt, are made of wool, cotton, and linen, generally uh, created as a tapestry, and are those that often uh, are classified as Coptic textiles, while those from the Eastern region are made in silk, generally in weft phase compound. Now, the weft phase compound and, um, is a complex technique that is the one used for these Sassanian textiles in silk. Normal textiles, simple textiles, are only of three types, tabby, twill, and satin. And they uh, are created with one set of work that basically are the vertical traits that are normally those stable, not movable, and one set of weft that is the horizontal, are the horizontal lines, are those that create the pattern. So the weft based compound of this Sassanian textile in silk employs two sets of weft. Basically, they, these two sets of weft cross the warp like in a sandwich, so we don't see the warp. It's a very complex uh, technique. So only a couple of silk fragments of this type were um, of very high quality were discovered in Egypt and most likely were imported, but we are not sure yet from where. Uh, the only textile fragment from Iran and dated to the Sassanian period are very damaged fragments of wool or cotton and uh, that do not show many patterns. Only a few like this here. Uh, show rosette or beads and an embroidered tiger, for instance. These are the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, later, well-preserved weaving made of tapestry, like this one, appeared but can be only dated to the 8th century, so after the Sassanian Empire, and somehow might be compared to the contemporary silk composition, specifically from uh, China. But why are these texts recognized as Sassanian then? The simple answer is because they are commonly associated with the rock relief of Tagebostan in northwestern Iran uh, that was once an hunting preserve and a garden paradise of the Sassanian king. Amongst the many Sassanian rock relief sites, this, although its origin is still very controversial, is characterized by large detailed depiction of clothing made with Central Asian and non-Central Asian, also Chinese, textiles. 
And I'm going to show you a few examples. These are some of the texts that are found in the western region of China or in uh, also Moshe Bayabak and Caucasus that appear in Tagikistan. These are some more that I recognize and compare with the fragment that uh, I analyzed. And also um, uh, what is recognized as Khosrow II between the Tree of Life, identical to those of the pillar in Kagebustan, but still 8th century. So this site might have been made by painters, possibly for rain rather than sculpture, as uh, Erzfeld uh, proposed, and therefore linked to the later cycle of um, uh, the Afrasiab painting in Sogdiana, where similar textile and costume decorate the whole of the ambassadors, or perhaps as suggested by Simone Cristoforetti, John Roberto Scarcia, by a Chinese and Byzantine master who, and I quote, created eclectic decoration different from the classical Sassanian types. Since we don't have written sources from the Sassanian period, we can find information of these compounds and early Islamic sources that mention Parniyan or Paran as textile from Eastern Turkestan or with decoration recalling coins. Indeed, the Chinese coins were different from uh, the Iranian types and golden coins found in China like the Byzantine solidity were used as decoration on clothing. So what do these patterns represent? Maybe gods or kings? Since Sassanians, we have to assume that they were related to the Iranian pantheon somehow. Both the Avesta and the Rig Veda, the early scripture of Zoroastrianism and Hinduism, and therefore the early sources of Indo-Iranian religions do not mention idols or icons, except for the goddess Anahita with anthropomorphic features. Rather, some gods are said to assume animal forms or are depicted as symbols. Unfortunately, not all these animals can be related to a god. Possibly the bird can be seen as a, a Varegna, the bird of prey, or a boar as a Varedragna, the god of victory, and again a horse or a lion as the god Mitra. But many are the hunting scenes in Sassanian and also Byzantine art where these animals are actually chased by the king. We might justify the appearance of some Iranian gods in form of animals only when we have clear symbols associated to them, such as the wings, the ribbon, and the purse, which record the far, um, the glory of Iran, like all the symbols that appear on stacon, coins, textiles, as you can see, and the wings that generally appear on the crown of the Sassanian kings in texts that are often transformed into a pedestal or seen only on some animals. The ribbon records a diadem as a symbol of royal investiture and also show in the depiction of Sassanian kings in, as I say, in relief and coins, appear especially on ducks, rum, stag, and horses in stucco and textiles. The purse appear in a combination of three on the back of coins as well as on Sassanian clothing. They were used to frame zoomorphic figures later. And these are some examples of the ribbon uh, on the run. Uh, most likely, in the spreading of these texts, the original motif lost their meanings and were indigenized in new form. An example is the double axe motif, discovered mostly in texts from Moshe Vayabatka in Northern Caucasus that might be seen as a transformation of two facing boar heads related to a local cult, as Anna Yerusalemskaya from the Hermitage Museum suggested. Possibly also the is the double axe of Zeus Labraunda that was already popular in Anatolia. However, there are a few elements in this animal on text that bring us back to the oldest known carpet in the world that I always mention during my talk because it's pretty important and to the relationship between Iranian, Chinese and Turkomongol population from the steppes. The carpet is the only one from Pazirik in the Artaic mountain made of knots rather than in felt like all the other material discovered in situ. It is made with 3,600 symmetrical double knot uh, per square centimeter, a type of knot that is known today as a Turkish knot and is very different from the Persian one that is no normally asymmetrical and is used for the beautiful Persian silk uh, rag and carpet. 
So looking at the, at the iconography of the Pasiric carpet, it's still very difficult to confirm whether this carpet was an Achaemenid gift for the Altai people or possibly a carpet locally made by Turkic person in contact with the Persian and therefore inspired by their iconography. Among the various patterns, except for this uh, sort of star of geometric uh, form that trace back to a relief from Nineveh in ancient Assyria, the stag repeated in the carpet, the carpet is the only element they connect to our textiles. Stag on pedestal, like horses and lions, seems to be amongst the most popular zoomorphic figures, as I previously mentioned. If we look at these two fragments here, um, we can see that they are similar but not identical. In the first pair, we have two small circles in the body there, uh, one a bit larger than the other. And these two can be seen as the emblem of the sun and the moon and are actually depicted as a such in later textiles. Um, and are also reminiscent, uh, reminiscent of the organs depicted in the stag of the Pasiri carpet. The rosette instead in the second pair of stag is one of the main motifs that appear in early Iranian art and as we have seen on the fragment in wool from the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, and also became very popular in Byzantine art. We can find the same rosette in the ceiling of Hagia Sophia, uh, what's in Persepolis uh, on the Apadana, for instance. However, only between the 5th and the 6th century CE when the various Turk-Iranian and Turk-Mongol population began to dominate Central Asia and Chinese territory, and especially during the period of the Northern Dynasties in China, these zoomorphic figures appear carved on sarcophagi or depicted in tombs. Moreover, the Sui Shu, the history of the Sui Dynasty, provide us with information regarding the, the, in, the import of Western textiles, possibly copied in workshop established in the Xinjiang, Gansu, and also Sichuan in the western region of China. As tribute or in exchange for horses, a trade that had already begun during the Han period in the second century and continued with the Uyghur in the 10th century. It seems that this geomorphic pattern, rather than related to Zoroastrian gods, had a totemic or a talismanic function, most, uh, mostly related to nomadic people, who had contact with both the Iranian and Chinese empires, and later in the 6th century were uh, present in the Sogdian Turfanese area and also um, uh, in contact with the Sogdian. Uh, since antiquity, in fact, the annual seasonal migration of nomadic people that I would commonly um, call the Scythians in Eurasia had already determined the circulation of art materials, technique, and iconography to different geographic areas. For instance, uh, these are just a few examples, uh, a golden stag from Crimea with five different animals overlaid and a combination of four phalera in a golden uh, from Betterschfeld, now Poland, dated to the 5th and beginning of the 4th century BCE, seems to embody this totemic aspect. Uh, the phalera includes a total of 16 animals divided into a set of four in alternative pairs. Each disc is possibly related to a different season and a constellation. This type of iconography is part of the so-called today animal style, which includes the combination of various animals that appear on other Sassanian objects, as well as in hunting scenes, as mentioned before, and these are some of the texts that the time reconstructed from um, Iran, from actually Japan, the first one created in the Soviet Turfanese area, to um, uh, Byzantine types of uh, discovery in the treasury of Eurasian cathedral. Um, and of course, we can find the same animals also on the right on and other metal work. Um, so the winged horse that often appear in these hunting scenes, like in the first one, for instance, is possibly the only exception amongst the various animals that was generally accepted that related to different Eurasian cultural and religious contexts. Although it can be easily related to the image of the mythological Greek uh, Pegasus, and in particular to Zeus, and therefore to Hellenized Central Asian art that began to spread with the arrival of Alexander the Great, during the Sassanian period, it was related to the sacred fire of the Zoroastrian faith, and the fire of the stallion was situated in Tagil Soleiman, 
um, uh, where there was a, a pool with perennial spring, and you see, uh, it is here that archaeological excavation, if I don't get wrong, have uncovered seals with winged horses indeed. There are a few representations, in fact, on Texas. These are uh, one from a private collection uh, of drinking horses, uh, also on a plate there on the uh, metalwork. Uh, a very refined piece with winged horse appears also in Egypt, now in France, and it is very different from the one in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That uh, and the bo both can, um, seems to um, to come from two different workshops. If we compare the two, in fact, uh, we will notice that the outline and the general look of the second one is less of the first one actually this one uh, probably from Central Asia is a little bit less realistic it's a little bit cartoony if you look at the detail um, however the wing horse during the previous Han period was seen by the Chinese as the Tianma heavily horse of their mythology the Han in fact increased trade and communication with the western region and imported the fastest Dai Yuan from Fergana uh, stallions in exchange for silk. The horse began to appear on Chinese objects of art and became a frequent pattern contextualized in narrative scenes or isolated with other elements in later Shui and Tang textiles. But it was especially in the later time period after the fall of the Sassanian that this textile with some morphic uh, pattern began to circulate and reappeared in Buddhist case. The beaded rounder was slowly replaced by, combin um, uh, by or combined together with the lotus flower and widely used in Buddhist caves as a form of mandala. The three beads emblem of the fire, like those found on Sassanian coins, were seen as the three jewels of Buddhism and became part of Buddhist textile or tanka painting and later as the main feature of the Ottoman Chintamani textiles. And this one is a piece from the 51 of the earliest piece from the 15th century. Interestingly, as I have previously mentioned, areas external to the main silk road, the inherited graphic element and also technique, they were combined together in a much more complex textile iconography that was discovered, as I said, in Qinghai about 40 years ago and remained mostly unpublished. An external southern Silk Road indeed connected the northern uh, Gansu and Xinjiang province to Sinch uh, Sichuan, crossing Xinhai. It is here in Dulan, where we have the Tibetan, uh, the royal Tibetan tombs, that many textiles were discovered. Uh, and are basically related to the Iranian war, possibly connected with the last Sassanian king, Peroz, that moved to uh, the Tang court. So, um, some examples are a ribbon with a Paladin scripture with the King of Kings, and this is particularly important because it was created with a technique called a retour, point repeat, that was used also to create a Gilgamesh on the Byzantine Shroud of Saint Victor in the treasury of the Cathedral of Sons in France. Or, um, and basically the technique um, is called a retour because if you look at the diagram, uh, the weft are in four color in that case, and the repeat one, two, three, four, and then backward four, three, two, one. So it's a very rare technique that we found basically only here and in Dulang. Um, so we have other examples like um, um, uh, the first golden weaving uh, ever discovered in Asia. The first so-called Sassanian dark is from Dulan. That is uh, the one, uh, one of the first examples on text, uh, like those that appear in the Kizil caves, uh, uh, or in uh, um, Takebustan, in Afrasiab, and many other places. The dark was one of the most uh, popular uh, pattern automorphic figures. Um, in 2014, I had the privilege to be uh, hosted for a couple of months at the China National Museum in Hangzhou, and I had asked the director of the museum, Zhao Feng, to see uh, texts from uh, Xinjiang and Gansu, but he was so generous to give me access to a collection of unpublished, um, I, I published a couple of them in the last two, three years, of fragments, possibly coming from Xinhai or other Central Asia area that was acquired through the Chinese market. 
The collection included many fragments, all made in wet face compound except two. And they were all very interesting, showing different zoomorphic figures on a red ground, like for instance this one um, that at that moment was um, was being restored and shows two uh, crossed uh, tiger or lions like those that appear on um, the uh, the ear with the cross lion in um, in France now. Um, it was clear to me that they were of very high quality, different from those discovered in Central Asia, and most importantly, they could definitely be dated to after the fall of the Sassanian Empire, and creating in that style that Bori Mashar uh, defined a uh, late Baroque, referring to all the Turco and Iranian uh, pattern and iconography uh, assembled together in the Tibetan uh, areas. So uh, somewhere, as I said, more interesting, the iconographic and historical analysis of uh, each of them brought me to this piece that is the last one that I reconstructed. Um, and is a very thick and damaged piece that, as I said, I left as the last and was the most challenging one. I decided to reconstruct um, everything by hand and I measured the piece and each single pattern and I used acetate sheets to create the composition as a whole. So of course I had no time to uh, present and discuss all the single reconstruction I made in Anjou but just briefly I will show you um, the most famous Sassanian duck with the ribbon in the beak that I found also there. Uh, like many of the fragments discovered in Qinghai, um, these have uh, the same features like a uh, floating thread on the back, on the reverse, and it's a technique and something that we discover only in Qinghai, or uh, what I like to call the pixel, pixel effect of the outline that is created with a very thick uh, warp. And those with randals, like most of, of these textiles, um, uh, enclosing zoomorphic figures show identical pattern with the same number of yarn and threads but each of different dimensions as you can see there. One roundel is always wider than the other one. Uh, we don't know much about the loom used to weave this type of textile but after having analyzed more than thousand samples, almost 2,000 actually, from collection worldwide, I believe that at least at the beginning of this type of web based uh, compound production, the weaver use an horizontal trowel loom. I agree with one of these ideas proposed by Zhao Feng about the employment of a non-mechanical vertical loom, which we can trace back to a carpet tradition shared by the majority of nomadic and semi-nomadic people living in Central Asia intended in a, of course, in a broad sense that will include also Mongolia, Tibet, and Eastern Iran. A possibility might be uh, a variation of the Iranian Zilulum that requires one of two people who work one on the front and the other one on the back. The verse, so the front of the texa will face back, uh, like in an horizontal loom, the face face down. So the weaver see the reverse of the textile during the weaving process. This compound, in fact, do not seem to have been worked with a contemporary movement of warp and weft in the creation of the pattern. Technical repeat occur only in the weft direction, so horizontally, but never in the warp direction, so vertically. Definitely, there was no mechanical patterning method. Neither the loom had a read or um, a read is this kind of comb that divides uh, the trade, and this is a work, this is a modern uh, textile, and the read is this part that divides equally the thread so that all the patterns have equal size. So definitely if this roundel had different uh, measure, it's because something like this missed, uh, was missing in, uh, in the loom. Um, Zhao Feng, a few years ago, published an example of possible Central Asian loom with cord leash system that most likely was used also for some of these textiles, the so-called Sassanian textile and those discovered in Tulan, many of which were woven starting from the outline and proceeding in both directions, then the inline and finally the ground. 
Now, when I began working on this thick fragment that I showed you before, I noticed graphic element that we can find on text that had in the Abbey Foundation in Switzerland, that is, they had one of the biggest uh, collection of Central Asian Chinese, uh, um, um, uh, Tibet, and also um, uh, textiles. So we have some elements. So we have a galloping horse here. So these pieces there are those from the Abbey Stiftung. Uh, a lion with a twisted curly mane and also the remains of vandals enclosing different animals uh, that most likely were framing a large medallion. Uh, the fragment from the Abel Stiftung in Switzerland include also a duck with a ribbon, almost identical to the type I showed you before, floating thread on the back there, and the second picture down, and also a Tibetan inscription on the back. I traced the pattern using different colors, and I traced perfect circles because, of course, I was doing everything by hand. And slowly, I added the missing part in the black using what I had and comparing it with different types of animals from other fragments. For instance, I could also see a tiger uh, with the geometry figures in the body, or a bull, uh, and another galloping horse. And for the latter of medium uh, rundel, I had only the feet of the animals, and I thought they could be related to a pair of stag, because they are almost identical. So based on the measure of the only medallion available, I tried to build up the others and also the lateral ones. At my first try, I wrongly designed 15 rundels. Then I realized that those from the Abbey had 16 rundels, and also that everything had to be mirrored and somehow equally divided. Although these rundles, like the others on different fragments, must have had each a different dimension, uh, as I explained before. So I retrace everything, trying to squeeze in uh, another rundle, a 16 rundle. They were all empty, of course, because I could not guess the animals. Uh, neither the central pairs um, of animals that I assume was particularly important in terms of visual impact and emblematic meaning. I designed a, fir a first pair based on what I believe was the most important and emblematic zoomorphic figure, the lion, with uh, uh, a, twist, a twisted curly uh, mane. Lions indeed appear on many hunting scenes as well as on textile covers of Buddhist Sutra and most importantly on those held in the Abek, uh, like you can see here. The fragment in the Abek see the uh, lion not standing on a pedestal, but somehow above two galloping horses. And the galloping horses, as I have mentioned before, is a feature of uh, Tulan, uh, Texas. Um, the interesting thing is that this medallion was created with uh, other small lobs or uh, rundles, each containing a single different uh, animal. And this type of figures is, on, is something that appeared in Iran around the 11th century. And this is an example from uh, Tehran. So I designed a first pair based on, uh, as I said, the most important uh, element. It was the, this is my first drawing there. Um, basically copied from those from the other Stiftung. And then uh, a second option was um, a couple of RAM uh, copied from another uh, fragment in uh, Hangzhou that I pair and mirror together. Um, uh, because these have a crown and also a ribbon, so I assume they were royal figures somehow. But at the end, I preferred the lion. I gave, um, I, I assumed it was the most popular and used figures. So it was pretty evident uh, that the composition as a whole, which I believe was originally created with four panels of about 2.62 feet uh, each, because I, I constructed the pattern as a whole. So basically, the color one is the what I copy in color, and everything else is what I reconstructed. Um, was too big and too thick to be used for clothing. We have some coeval and lateral example of clothing that show big medallion, but my reconstruction was really too big and would not have made sense to cut it in smaller pieces just for clothing or small items. 
Looking at the historical context and at the material evidence from Dulan, it makes sense to me to relate both the iconographic composition and the dimension to the semi-nomadic lifestyle of the people living in the area. In the Tibetan tombs in Dulan, together with texts, are also many horse skeletons were discovered, um, confirming the nomadic and semi-nomadic aspect of these people, um, part of whom had Mongolian ancestor. The use of including horses, big rags, etc., can be in fact traced back to the Altai Mountain and to the Pasiri carpet mentioned before. We know also that such one, there, where Chengdu is located, has been produced textile since antiquity. Um, and uh, also, uh, Chengdu sent bamboo uh, material, or bamboo, to uh, Gansu and Xinjiang uh, to create and to build a room. So based on the data collected and my reconstruction, I believe that the original panel was created for the interior of a tent, as since we don't know um, about the provenance of the fragment, but I assume from uh, a tomb, there is a chance that it was woven to recreate a tent for the afterlife. Although they are generally made in white felt, um, the interior of these tents are pretty spectacular. They are co covered with panels and rugs, like modern uh, one. Um, so, of course, the fragment that I reconstructed probably belonged to a noble person because the weaving and the composition is, was really too sophisticated and refined, as well as the pattern enclosed in these rundles. So, a few months ago, while I was working on the picture to be included in my forthcoming books and clear the copyrights, I came across two online images. I looked carefully, and especially the first one reminded me of something that I had already seen before. I researched more, and I discovered that they are in the Abu Stiftung, and uh, had been displayed in 2017 in the exhibition Material Traces Conserving and Exploring Textiles. So I contacted Dr. Regula Shorta, that is the director of the um, Stiftung, who gave me more information about the pieces and emailed me better photos so that I could see the complete composition. As you can see, both pieces have a rounder surrounded by multiple animals inscribed each of them in a rounder or lobs, and these animals are the same already seen in other fragments produced in southern western region of China. Um, according to the Arabic, the panel is a web-based compound created with um, eight colors, uh, about uh, six uh, feet uh, large and tall, and without, uh, of course, the, the attached part on top and at the bottom. Um, so, comparing the fragment in Anjou and my reconstruction with the panel in the Abbot, it seems like the fragment in Anjou must have been the continuation of the panel in Switzerland. I got pretty close with my measurement, uh, although I assume that the composition as a whole was created by four panels, because I created the whole composition even with the lateral random. Instead, the original one, as you can see, is only a quarter of the random at the corner there. Uh, but the central one is pretty close. I mean, my is 160 uh, centimeters and the one is 175, so just 15 centimeters um, more. Um, and this actually uh, would make sense according to a document from Turfan that mentioned the use of loom of about 2 meters, so 6.5 feet in high and always wider than 1 meter, 3.2 feet. However, if the loom really was a, a variation of the Zilu loom in Iran, we have to consider also that uh, Zilu loom can be 4 meters high and can reach a uh, width of 10 meters. And therefore, perhaps uh, the original panel was much longer. Clearly, I didn't squeeze the roundel enough. Uh, in fact, the original piece has 20 small roundel rather than 16 and an overall uh, oval shape. Uh, and it includes uh, a flower in the center, and as you can see, two standing uh, rum. So I actually got really close. One of, I chose the lion, but my second one was the right one, although in the original panel they are standing uh, against the plant. 
this register was clearly used to depict the so-called Seymour, like the one on the poster, uh, that in this form began to appear at the very end of the Sassanian period and the early century of the Islamic period. And it, the one from Dulan, or I assume from Dulan, was created like other Central Asian animals, so in pair and standing rather than alone and sitting like uh, on the, the most popular type. And this type of Simur, by the way, was created in, on the Byzantine side, more than Central Asia. Um, so, um, basically, to conclude, although last year remain, and as you can see, they appear also, I uh, forgot to mention, um, uh, appear on, um, on normal, I mean, normal animals are um, actually in this position along the Silk Road. So, this is part of a popular daily imagery that people copy and reproduce on textiles. Uh, and if you like, we can uh, refer to this textile as part of the animal style world. So, although last year remains of a weight room from the Sassanian period, which definitely confirmed the production of textile in Iran, um, um, was discovered, the so called Sassanian textile cannot be confirmed to be original Sassanian, but it rather seemed a Central Asian production that transformed Turkiranian and also some Indian iconographic elements related to the ancestral ritual into Chinese silk, which were acquired, transformed, and transmitted by nomadic and semi-nomadic people, um, making this weaving part, as I, as I say, of the so-called animal style tradition. Most likely, uh, being textile and medium easy to move, it became prototype for more painting and decoration like those in Tagebustan as well. And especially during the early Islamic period, they were embellished and reproduced in great quantity as a mark of the long durée uh, Turkey Iranian culture in Eurasia, like in Samara. And these are, uh, again, in the Metropolitan Museum and are reproduction of wood painting created by uh, Erzfeld uh, from uh, Samara. Um, as well as included in the Byzantine iconographic repertoire that decorate the European churches that uh, inherited the so-called Sassanian text uh, patterns. Thank you.